Grace Bible Church Pearlside Online. What would you choose? A nice, clean, shiny, brand new quarter or a raggedy, dirty old $100 bill? The value hasn't changed. Pastor Norman Nakanishi shows us how God values us greatly beyond our failures of our past in his message, Turning Defeat into Victory. Part one of our series, Believe Again. It's time for a fresh start. How many of you failed before in something, somewhere, someplace, at some time? All of us have. But when we look at scripture, here's what we need to know about Jesus, that our failures fail to phase how Jesus loves and values us. We live in such a performance culture, we think that we're only loved and accepted when we succeed, and that's really not true. After the resurrection of Christ, many people forget that he walked the earth for 40 days. You realize that? You know what Jesus was doing, right? He was doing follow-up which is what we all need to do right now, that Easter's not the end, where we've done a religious duty of inviting people. Now the real work of love begins. Jesus hung around and he followed up. We need to follow up now, and we need to not just fish for men, we need to finish the commission of reaching our friends and family. Can I hear an amen in the house here this morning? And so Jesus stuck around for 40 days, and after 40 days, after the resurrection, there was the ascension, but he made sure his disciples knew that this was only beginning. And we are only beginning in our new, in our new uh, season. Now, Jesus was having all the disciples failed, because they all fled, they all fled when they realized that their hero, the Messiah, would be crucified. They all fled for their lives. They feared because they, f- they thought they would be apprehended by Roman authorities who associated them with this Messiah who people called the King of the Jews. And in that day, historically, no one challenged Caesar. Any threat to Caesar, there would be only one emperor and one king was annihilated. They were executed or imprisoned. And so Peter, out of all the disciples, though, failed with emphasis. He cursed, he swore, he denied Jesus in public three times. And so his failure was bigger than any other person's failure. How many of you ever felt like you failed big before? I have. But you know what? Jesus, Jesus looks at that very differently. And so he's having a meal with his disciples, right? Having breakfast. And he has this conversation with Peter. Peter, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? All of what you're doing. Love more than this, this, this occupation you're, 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 you know, that you're doing, that you're thinking of going back to. He said, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Notice the commission after the resurrection and failure. That's what Jesus is calling us to do right now as a spiritual family. It's not over. Easter was just the beginning for us to go feed lambs, take care of sheep, follow up with friends and family. Can I hear an amen? Okay. Now, he says, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep the third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And I want you to notice, Jesus throughout this passage or anywhere in in scripture does not make one mention about Peter's failure. Nothing. Why? Because it's finished. Jesus knows that Peter's beat himself up. He knows the remorse that Peter feels. He knows Peter's face is failure. His concern would be that he doesn't live there. That's the Lord's concern with us, that we don't live in the memory of our past failures. We don't live in the memory, maybe, of our, or or the reality of our present failure. In fact, what the way he brings Peter to healing, he says, get off of yourself and go love others. You want to know what the greatest healing antidote for the memory or the cloud of your failure or disappointment is? Get your attention off of yourself, grab on to the Lord, and go love other people. People far from God, people who came on Easter, follow up, because they'll all have questions. 
The seed of the gospel is in them, and now go to meet with them. Go to connect with them. Pray with them. Now love them, because here's why. They'll think that I was only invited on Easter to fulfill your religious obligation to come to your event. You know why I know that? I was once that guy. And I can tell you right now, Jesus hung around 40 days to make sure we understand that fishing and follow-up go together. And then he left, leaving that job in the hands of his disciples. That would be us. Slap your neighbor and says, champ, that's you. <laughs> All right. Now, when we come to the end of ourselves, that's when God gives us all of himself. Failure is a tool that brings us to realize, you know what? Moving out of failure, moving out of a shattered shard of a past, it's not willpower, it's not our power, it's got to be by his power, all right? And so, he gives them a promise. He says, look, I'm going to leave. I'm resurrected, I'm going to ascend. He gives them the promise with this command, be filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Because we never become what God wants us to be. We never are able to believe again and engender a fresh start apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he gives them a promise just before he ascends 40 days later. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word power is the word, is the Greek word dunamis, where we get the English word dynamite. So this is awesome. When we receive Christ, we receive the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But there is another experience after salvation, after by faith receiving Christ. And we find here this promise fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days, a festival 50 days after the crucifixion or Passover, 50 days, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. This is a prayer meeting. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on all of them or each of them and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The disciples failed under fire but then they were filled with God's fire and these disciples who fled, who failed in cowardice and fear, Jesus said, you've come to the end of yourself, now I'm going to give you all of myself. And he says, I'm going to give you fire. Holy Spirit fell on them. We have in your bulletin, you will see a path of discipleship classes, G-R-A-C-E. One of those classes is Arise. That is where we pray for people to receive the, what is known as the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire and power and we soak you so that we don't hide that part of Christianity that many people say is not for daily. We lay hands on you gently and we pray after giving you teaching, times of ministry, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would come on you just like this. And one of the manifestations is you begin to speak in a prayer language that's not of this earth. It is a perfect bull's-eye prayer that your spirit bypasses your mind. This is what was needed. This is what jettisons you out of where you are to where God wants to take you. Again, it's not willpower, it's not your power, and it's His, his power. A lot of people are a bit ashamed, especially if you're Oriental. I don't want to be speaking in these weird languages. What do people think of me? I don't think people think too much of you. See, we start fearing the power of God when it's all about us. And so Jesus said, you're not going to go out by your power. Look at you. You all chickened out. You need my power. So here's how it's coming. You're going to speak in some baby language. It's a prayer language. Fire will fall on you. You get a bit emotional. And then watch me work. If you haven't been through our grace path yet, our discipleship path, you need to. We say everybody who calls Pearlside home needs to go through those classes. G-R-A-C-E. Making sure the word of God is deep in our soul because the power begins there. And then we move forward through that path. That's for another time, but you can check it out in your bulletin. Power. But the power is pent up unless the trigger of action by faith is pulled. Many people, many of us receive Christ. We, we have received the baptism of the Spirit. 
but unless we begin to act by faith on what scripture tells us to do, how we are to be, we stay stuck and the power of God just gets inbred and stagnant in our lives. Dynamite cannot be contained and should not be contained, right? That is the kind of power God puts in your life when you come to Christ and you come into that place of receiving the filling of the Holy Spirit and then here's what we're to do. Believe and simply do what Jesus says. That's the trigger to unleashing the power in you and through you because the power you have is not just for you. It's supposed to go through you. He's supposed to work through you. And the reason many people don't believe in miracles and healings and, and new beginnings and, sup- and the supernatural and the amazing is they never, we never pull the trigger of faith to see how a God who works in us can work through us. You pray for a sick person and see them healed, all of a sudden, your belief changes. Your actions change. You don't run to Pastor Camille and go, oh, Pastor Camille, Pastor Camille, can you pray for Sister Fina? No, man, you pray for him. Everybody. Everybody was filled in an upper room. We want everybody to go through our grace path because when we pray on for you, you'll never be the same. I prayed for my barber when this church started. We laid hands on her in a living room. I know when we see we lay hands on her, some of you go, man, that sounds really nasty. Okay, but it's a scriptural term. We were like 20 people. She was a barber. And now she's an intercessor, by the way. She sits up top. I don't know if sure if you're there. And the power of God hit her, no music, no nothing. We just said, this is scripture. We're going to pull the trigger. We're going to act on it. The power of God hit her. She fell into the window. This is, if you know her, she don't fake stuff. She didn't know the Lord, had no clue. But by faith, we just pulled the trigger. 23 years later, she still cuts my hair. In fact, I just cut my hair, as you can see, this past week. Okay? God wants to move the same way through you. God wants to move miraculously through you, financially, physically, relationally. But you've got to pull the the, the trigger of behavior in faith followed by what you believe. How many believe in Jesus? How many believe that the word of God is true? How many believe God's word says all things are possible? Then do it. Because the reason why you have not experienced the amazing life, which we'll talk about next week, is you're stuck with knowledge, journaling, drinking coffee, listening to worship music on your phone or device, and you think, this is USA Christianity. USA bad boys. I love that show, Tony. <laughs> it's so funny. USA. See, in America, we got too much USA Christianity. Ooh, journal, coffee, read, podcast. Oh, I love Jesus. You love nothing. (laughs) Get off of yourself. Get out there. Follow up on the people who are here. Pray for them. Are they sick? Don't run the basic meal. Oh, my God. No, you pray for them. Slap your neighbor and say, you pray for them. (laughs) The problem is we know so much, we criticize so abundantly, we don't do anything. People told me, you can't plant a church in Pearl City. Nobody succeeds there. (laughs) It was hard at first. It was, you know what we're doing? We were praying for the power to hit people, and it did. You know the story. We have to write a book on it. We had a lot of demonic ministry for five years going on, and, and the Lord said, well, you wanted the book of Acts, That's what it looks like. I said, well, maybe not that much. (laughs) But people were getting saved. We raised people from the dead. People got the spirit with the spirit. We had people getting delivered. Cancers were being healed. We intentionalized action. And we we were like 80 to 90 people. That's how we grew. You know what my fear is? We have this building now. We get all nice music, nice Aloha shirts, though it's old. Right? We get nice staff. We have nice carpet. We have stinking big chairs and we get all nice, and nothing happens. That's why I'm telling you, Easter's over, let's get busy. Let's go out to our friends and family. What's the use if they never come back? Then all they've done is said a prayer, and they think they're going to heaven by saying a prayer. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're talking discipleship. We fish, 
but we've got to finish. And so, believe and do what Jesus says, and here's the takeaway, and we're gonna call it Patricia Corvallo, allow action to redirect emotion. He said, well, I don't feel faith. I don't feel like sharing the gospel. I don't feel like following up. That's being too pushy. God don't care what you feel. He just wants, he cares about what you obey. And so look at what scripture says. So Peter, the failure, the ultimate failure, he stood up with the 11, the Holy Spirit fell, he goes outside of the upper room, he leaves the nice, the, 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 the prayer building, and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. This crowd, some of them go, hey, you're Peter, you freaked out, you cursed the Lord, you failed, you chicken. Why should we listen to you? He didn't listen to them, he kept talking. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. He is delivering the word. For all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Oh man, we're talking Peter. I mean, the most abject failure gives voice to victory. I am sure he had to overcome the feelings of failed memories. I was the one who cursed and swore. I was the one, I was the guy with the linebacker body, but when it came to crunch time, I chickened out. And now he's coming out. And probably, I would have picked John. I would have picked somebody else. You had your moment. It's too much embarrassment. Some of you may be stuck. Don't let your failure and yesterday define you and keep you where you are. It's time to believe again. It's time for a fresh start. I don't care what area it is. I am 60 stinking years old. You know why I walk from the structure? If I act 60, I ride the shuttle. <laughs> this morning, listen. I was doing some squats at the gym yesterday and, and, and kind of, I was working my calves. Okay, some of you, the eight o'clock people say, hey, we saw you at the gym, you're inspiring. I said, okay, you're lying, but that's okay. <laughs> and I had knee problems. And I'm thinking about Tony, what he t told me over the years, what you, what you do and all that. So I'm working and I'm moaning like a sissy, you know, some, sometime through the night. And I, my wife brought me, okay careful, we got more time in this service. I'm going off on tangents already, and I'm, where's Patricia? We'll get to you. Hang in there. Okay, keep breathing. Woosa. Yeah. And I thought, my, my wife said, are, are we going to take the shuttle? I said, yeah. Then I went, no. I'm walking this thing out, and I walk right up that hill. You know why I do that? I don't want to act old. I am not an invalid. I am not a hospital case. I am 60, muscular, lean, a virile athlete. I am a son of God. I will live forever. This is the temple he gave me. He gave me two legs not to ride but to walk, so I will walk up that hill because that's what the disciples did. Do you think they had a shuttle? <laughs> Now, I know you know what I'm saying. I know you, are you intercessors praying for me? This thing is getting pretty nasty right now. <laughs> Folks, the problem some of us has is, have is we act like what we were. Artie Wilson's here, right? Artie comes all the time. I notice you're not getting into the second row anymore. Shame on you, a little slow now. <laughs> he played in the Old Timers UH reunion game of alumni. Artie's older than I am. And he played full court basketball. I, I call him, I said, man, are you stupid? <laughs> and he went, wait a minute. He said, no, I'm gonna play again next year. That's the spirit. Stretch first. <laughs> but that's the spirit. He just started, you give voice. Look, behavior follows belief. New behavior, however, can also shape and give form to what you believe. Without action, it's not real. You say, I can't. Let, get, get, Patricia, get ready, honestly. I, you know, I miss football, so I'm gonna tell a football moment. I remember in 2006, traveling with the University of Hawaii football team to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Alabama, right? The football gods. I remember doing a chapel. And uh, as I did the chapel, the coaches said, now, 
We forgot to tell you that this is gonna be broadcast live to about one third of the United States. I said, oh, okay. And uh, don't be freaked out by all the lights and everything, it's gonna be pretty packed. So I'm thinking, oh my God, okay. What do you think I felt? Fear, look at me, not an athlete. We're in the SEC country, all right? I'm thinking, live, television, yeah. So I meet the Fox crew. This is the Fox crew. The Fox crew you see on TV. Good talking, it was so unusual to have a Hawaii team go all the way to Alabama and get ready to have their butt kicked, which we almost beat them, by the way. And then you got this little five feet, five inch Asian chap. They thought this would be a really nice moment. It's such a unique thing. You have Jerry Glanville as a defensive coordinator, June Jones coming back. You know, I'm not thinking about, I'm going in there, and he says, look, here's what we're going to do. I meet the guys. He says, look, here's what's going to happen. I walk in, the place is lit up, the place is packed, I see cameras everywhere, and I'm thinking, oh my God. And they go, okay, listen, we're gonna go three, two, one, and you're on. And that's what happened. Camera's rolling, people are looking at me, the team and the families are in front of me, and they're going, three, two, one. I couldn't say, I'm not worthy, wait, stop, 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 stop. Can I go home and you send another chaplain? See, that's what some of you are saying. See, I can't lead a grace group. I'm too busy. Get unbusy. I can't be an apprentice. I can't serve. I can't be a parking attendant. I can't. I can't. You know what the issue is sometimes? You don't want to. Woo! Yeah. Jesus wants you to be I don't feel like it. Usa. Usa. Get the Usa out of here. I was there, and, I, and then I just lit it, three, two, one, and I just, bang. Afterwards, the Fox crew came to me. They went, you do this all the time? I said, was it that bad? And they said, man, that was awesome. We, we've seen travels before, but not like that. And I don't have a clue to remember what the heck I said. <laughs> you just... Be it in the moment. See, that's what, that's what Peter did. When he stood up, he gave voice to victory. Patricia, come now before I start going off on more tangents. <laughs> Patricia Cravalho, one of my heroes. She's on our staff, but this is her story before we go deeper. Watch this. My name is Patricia Carvalho. I um, work currently as a staff member of Grace Bible Pearlside, helping at the youth ministry. Part of the things I do every day is go into different campuses and I teach all our young adults, men and women, how to be able to properly train our student leaders to um, reach out to their friends. When I grew up in the Philippines, my mom never really took track of the men that would come in and out of our house. And when that happened, um, I remember being abused or sexually molested by um, her friends and it happened repetitively in my family by different men and from six years old onwards I was sexually abused and molested for about a decade of my life. My mom got into a relationship with my stepdad and um, I remember again having been molested by my stepdad and at 14 um, when my mom went to visit another country, it left the opportunity for him to be alone with me. And so that's when he raped me. I would think that running to my mom for protection and telling her that these things are happening, that she would have done something about it. And she said, you know, um, for the sake of the family and for the sake of the unit of the family, I can't do anything. And what happens is I get into a relationship and um, I get pregnant. The, the, the guy, he leaves me the day that he finds out I was pregnant. And so I ran, to, I ran to church. The more and more that I started knowing about him, the more and more that his love started to melt all those walls in my heart away. And um, one of the biggest challenges for me was really uh, reading in his word. And he says, you know, how, now I've forgiven you, now go and forgive others. But when he began to challenge me, about forgiving others, I was like, wait, you mean forgiving those who abused me? Forgiving those who hurt me? Forgiving my son's dad that left me and left me for, for you know, and, and hasn't even said hi to my son? And oh, that really like was stretching me as a Christian. And I was actually, I was actually able to, um, to confront my parents and especially my stepdad 
and my mom and forgive them face to face. And I told them, you know, I forgive you. Even when they weren't sorry, I said, I forgive you. And what I love about that is that God was able to take that and turn it around. And I actually still have a very good relationship with my mom till this day. And my stepdad, I, I still talk to him. He walked me down the aisle when I was married. And you know, the story that I share is not just for me, but it's for those, the women that are watching, the women that are hearing this, for me to be able to share that it's only he could have done this. That's pretty staggering stuff. I mean, I've watched this about 20 times now. Forgiveness and emotion don't go together. How were you able to do that? Because you, receiving forgiveness from the Lord, giving forgiveness to the abusers, your parents preached to us, Patricia, give us the word. Well, when I started coming to church and, and really getting to know more about God, when I found out what he did on the cross for me, when I found out that Jesus went through abuse, went through pain, went through all that suffering just to forgive me, just to forgive my sin and to set me free, I remember feeling that love and feeling that realization for the first time. And I think when, when I found that out, that's what opened my eyes to see that the life that I was living wasn't enough that the the, the 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 past that i thought i had that was following me around you see when you go through abuse and and when you're traumatized like that you begin to believe the lies that was told to you that you wanted this that by six years old they they tell you you want this that is this is your fault so you begin to believe the lies and you live out in shame and you live out in such a defeated mentality and then you begin to mask the pain by being tough and by being mean to other people because there's no other way for you to be able to relate to others because you've had to teach yourself to be strong. And so when, 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 when I be began to go to church and began to surround myself with Grace Group and the church community and just being in prayer and being in Christ's presence, that's when I began to feel His love really tear down the walls in my heart and really begin to show me who, who the Word said I was and who God said I was instead of what my past dictated and what people said about me. And, you know, it was hard for me to believe it. It was hard for me to even wrap my mind around it. But the more and more and more I allowed myself to get in the Word and speak the Word over me, that's when God began to show me that He has a new life for me and that He has a new identity for me and that my past doesn't have to... To, uh, to follow me around, but that I am made new, that he has made me a new creation, and I am no longer, I don't know, I no longer have a scarlet letter on my head. Instead, he has wiped me clean, he has washed my sins away, and that he can actually use me to share the story to other people. The reality, the shocking reality to this, because, I mean, Patricia's a real firecracker on our staff. It, listen to this, you like this. She says, please forgive my slowness. English is my second language, and I think in Tagalog. When she said that in our staff meeting, I said, man, we all in trouble if English is your second language. Amazing. So as I listen to this, though, you took a second step. The language of forgiveness. Your second, the second language of forgiveness, if it goes well, is reconciliation. Let me make something clear, because people always get this mixed up. Forgiveness is one thing, and it's to free you. It's not to free them, it's to free you. See, when you forgive, Scripture says, then they're placed in the hands of God. You've let go. If you hold on to resentment, the American Medical Association has now quantified evidence that long-held resentment and unforgiveness will create a bodily reaction that produces diseases and infirmities, including cancer. See, the Lord's not made us to hold those things, and if anybody should have and could have, it was you. But you talk about your dad walking you down, down the aisle. You, we have a picture of that, okay? And um, now, obviously, his back is to us to protect his identity. How did that come about? Because this is the part, when you were talking about this, I went, whoa. Did you have to do that, and why did you do that, and how did you come to that? I remember coming to the decision of um, having to choose who would walk me down the aisle, and um, 
Actually, my mom wanted me to walk, wanted to walk me down the aisle, but I said I wanted my son to walk me down the aisle because my son was, you know, the man in my life, and I was a single mom for 12 years. So when I met my husband, I wanted him to have the privilege of walking me down the aisle. And so I invited, you know, my family to the wedding. My stepdad was there, and at that moment, I saw him, and I just felt a nudge in my heart to say, "Let him walk you down the aisle. Allow him that privilege to show the world that redemption is possible. That it's not just." It's not just forgiveness, but that there can actually be restoration of relationship. And I remember when I called him aside and I said, at that moment, can you walk me down the aisle? Like tears filled up his eyes because years wow. before that, he actually came to me and he asked for forgiveness from me. And he said, I'm sorry for doing that to you. Would you forgive me? And God began to change him. And he is a new man now. And the way God chose to see me, the way God chose to forgive me, is the same way I chose to extend that forgiveness to him. Because God doesn't see him as an abuser anymore either. He sees him as a changed man. He sees him as my father. And part of that, I wanted to give him that honor. To be able to walk me down the aisle so that I can walk away from the past that I had and walk towards my future with my husband and my son by my side. You talk about pulling a trigger of faith. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you women would have done that? Not that God would require that of you. Forgiveness is unconditional. Reconciliation is optional. It follows trust. And everybody here really understand that forgiveness is unconditional if we don't forgive our spiritual enemy has territory to take us out okay but that doesn't mean you become good buddies with an abuser in this case it was a, a very sacred role your mother your son but it became your father that's a choice and a voice and an act that is etched in your annals forever that's pretty astounding stuff. Did you find doing that changed you? How did that affect you? Did you go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Dirty rat. Or, because we didn't, we didn't rehearse this at all. I, I, so we're making, this is the whole make it stuff up okay. service. Right. Okay. Usa, right? <laughs> um, Usa, but, don't. But, yeah. you know, actually my mom kind of felt bad when that happened because mm. she was expecting that she would. And, um, and I think when that happened, for me, it allowed me to show my son that, you know, I'm not just talking this talk, I'm going to show you how this looks like so that one day when you come across your real dad who has never been wow. in your life, you can do the same thing and say, I can forgive you, I can walk with you, you can journey with me and, and not bat an eyelash because my mom was able to walk through that and now I want you to do this. And I think it also showed a picture for, to my husband to say that it doesn't matter where your past wow. came from. He, had cho he chose to accept me. And, and when that happened, I think it was just a beautiful symbol of how, the Christ, how Christ is gonna come one day and he's gonna be our groom and we're gonna be his bride. And no matter how much of a blemish we had or a stain we had in our life, we're gonna walk down purely because he's expecting us yeah. to come to him. And, and really he's rejoicing over us. So that, just that picture alone, shows me that, you know, that's the redemption of Christ. That we don't just have a story to share, but we can share about His power and His redemption. That it's not just about forgiveness, but it's about the fullness of life. Christ came so that we can live a life abundant. And I want to just challenge everybody today that are, is the life that you're living, does it show the world that it's abundant? Does it show the world that Christ is alive? Because it should. It should. We should be the examples of Peter's and Paul's, that we should be the modern day disciples and they can say they're crazy for God and God is alive because of them. Your English is their second language. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit came on you and I guess your foreign language is English and that's what happens. Um, the fruit of abandonment was her son Christian. The statistics of a son born into this whole cacophony of abuse are very nil about a boy turning out fine. This is Christian on screen demonstrating the next generation and redemption. <laughs> When I was younger, it was always, yeah, it was hard for me to socialize, especially since I was homeschooled. And the fact that um, 
I never really like talked to people before, you know. I uh, the only people I really talked to was like the church people, but that was only like once a week, so I never really got to actually engage so much in a conversation, especially with new people. Yeah, I'm very relational, so I always like think relationships between friends and family are one of the strongest points you can ever have. Since my dad left when we were, I was younger, I was I was always afraid that they were just gonna reject me and just you know like my friendship was broken and no one in the school and like accept me. Yeah, you know, I always like ask God, you know, or pray to God that if you can help me, and, like try to help me overcome this, because um, I know that you have something planned for me, even though I'm nervous to do talk in front of people. Like, can you like help me overcome this fear so I can start inviting my friends and start talking? And then when I came to this high school, it really opened up a chance for that to happen. And um, you know, so I've been trying to invite a lot of my friends and. You know, now I'm like more social and I, I love talking. <laughs> you know, I asked people a few times and then after a while of asking, I realized no one was rejecting me so much. But you know, like just the occasional yes and no's and maybe's, but not so much as rejecting me as a friend in general or for who I am. So one of the people, uh, so some people I've been uh, working on and uh, with uh, trying to bring them closer to God is actually Cody and uh, Al. So I've been working with them, um, doing one-to-one, -one and you know, just seeing how their hearts are changing through God and how God's changing their hearts is it's really amazing. You know, it's just that when I saw first saw Cody get, get saved through uh, the church on Friday night, it just like really changed my heart. You know, I was like, oh wow, God help, was able to use me to get get him here. Yeah. Like mother, like son, and here's a, 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 a here's a here's a young man with a very challenging background, but he's not hanging his head on one of Hawaii's biggest high schools and roughest high schools. And what he's doing is making disciples. He's taking the gospel and take putting behavior and action to what he believes. And Jesus is very big to Christian because he sees the gospel changing them. That's what you got to do, adults. adult see that's where god's amazingness becomes real not that we keep the gospel to ourselves because we don't want people to think we're a jesus freak you do that you bottle up the power eventually you start living your past and the reason you could forgive your folks is the gospel changed them and he could walk you down the aisle because jesus was in him because of her testimony man see next week we're going to talk about the recipe for amazing the li living the life god meant for you to live and a lot of this is not keeping Jesus to yourself. A parting shot, because he ain't doing it. I mean, the guy's renovating our youth ministry almost single-handedly. And so are you. Give us a parting shot. You just saw your son. We heard about you. You know, Tagalog if you Tagalog need to. Tagalog if I... <laughs> okay. You know, um, the reason why we do this is because of them. There's a generation out there that is thirsty for love and thirsty for acceptance and all they know is what the schools and their friends and non-Christian people show them. And you know, don't, take, don't look at this lightly. I mean, I read the news every day and I see ISIS recruiting 15, 16 year olds right. to belong to them. I cannot sit down and say, that's okay. That is come not on, okay. Yeah. Something in us has, has to come up, stand up and say, that's no longer okay and tell others, repent and be baptized because this promise of Jesus is not just for you, just like Peter said, it's for you and your sons and the generations Ooh. after. And we have to be that passionate about Jesus. We have to be that passionate about the gospel. We have to be that passionate about the power of the Holy Spirit because if we won't, ISIS will. So let that shake you up a little bit. Let that move you a little bit to do something about this. Because there's other people that are wanting to get this generation. There's an enemy out there that wants to kill, steal, and, and destroy this next generation. Are we, the uncles, the aunts, the parents, the grandmothers and grandfathers, are we going to just let, sit down and watch that happen? Or are we going to make a difference and invest into the next generation? So I just want to encourage you with that. Stand up, do something, share the gospel, because really that is, that is, we are the hope of Christ in the world. We are the church. This is what he left. There is no plan B. Mm. This, this is us. So we have to go out there and do something about it. Oh, can you do that again in Tagalog for all the Filipinos? I mean... <laughs> 
I gotta think, that was second language. I wonder what the first language sounds like, fire. Patricia, I'm gonna ask you, and, and, and we're gonna take communion right after, would you close us in prayer, and then we'll prepare for communion. God, I thank you that you didn't, you didn't stop before the cross, God, that you went all the way. And because we were your passion and we were your joy, God, you endured the cross. And so, Father, I pray that today we would get the realization of that and that we would be passionate about you and who you are and making disciples. God, I pray that we wouldn't just sit, Lord God, and watch the world go by, but we would actually be part of the work that you are doing, knowing that it's an honor to work alongside of you, to go and tell the world about you and that you are alive and you are still king. Father, I pray that everyone, Lord God, in this room, including I, Father, that we would be more than passionate, God, in this next season. Lord, pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, God, because we cannot do this alone. We can only do this by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.